Chapter 3 The Saturday Uncle Marco left was a miserably cold and bleak January day with snow flurries in the air. In the winter, I always secretly prayed there would be a blizzard when he was supposed to go so that he would be delayed for a day or two or even a week. But oddly, no matter how bad the weather was, Uncle Marco's flights were never canceled. He would politely ask me to say goodbye to Aunt Ruth and hug me, then get into a taxi in his long woolen coat carrying his old leather satchel. There was always a certain tension about him when he left. I couldn't tell whether he was excited or apprehensive or a mixture of both. And Aunt Ruth was right. I always was depressed after he went away. Though I tried to hide it so she wouldn't get angry, it wasn't easy. This time, it was worse than usual. Uncle Marco put a finger to his lips as the cab was pulling away, not realizing that Aunt Ruth was watching, too. What was that all about? Aunt Ruth demanded as I stepped inside. It looked like he was telling you to keep quiet about something. I didn't notice anything, I said, pretending to wipe a speck of dust out of my eye. Aunt Ruth glared at me. You sure? She said suspiciously. Then she sighed. You know, it really bothers me the way you get so moody after that man leaves, she complained. I'm the one who brought you up. I'm the one who took care of you like a mother. He couldn't have cared less about you. He was always away. It's easy for him to be fun and lovable when he's only here for a couple of days every few months. She lit a cigarette and blew smoke at me. He didn't have to nurse you when you were sick, or make sure you did your homework, or buy clothes for you, or give you nourishing food every day, and yet you obviously adore him and barely tolerate me. It hurts, Annie. It really, really hurts. But it's not like that, Aunt Ruth. I really do appreciate anything you've, everything you've done for me, I said. I don't appreciate that tone of voice. And I meant what I said the other night. If I find out you and that man are hiding anything from me, that's the end of his annuity. And to think what my life would have been like if I hadn't been burdened with you all these years. <sighs> it would have been exactly the same, except you wouldn't have had the pleasure of complaining about me, I thought. I had better go do some studying to make up for the last couple of days, I said. Let me know if you need some help with anything. Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time cooking, if that's what you're thinking, she said. Unlike your precious uncle, I work five days a week, in case you didn't notice. I've earned the right to relax on Saturday. She sank heavily down in front of the TV, her cigarettes and candy within easy reach. I trudged up the big wooden staircase with the carved banister and the stained glass window on the landing, thinking about running away. I knew there were a lot of kids my age who had left home and were surviving somehow on the streets. Almost anything would be better than living with Aunt Ruth. Except it was so cold out there. And what would I do about money? Even at 15, I didn't have anything like my own bank account. Aunt Ruth doled out the cash very stingily, and only when I worked up the nerve to ask. I never had a regular allowance. But the main reason I didn't run away was that if I did... I would miss Uncle Marco the next time he came back. I wondered if he would come back at all if it weren't for me. The phone rang. I didn't have one in my room, of course, but there was one in the second floor hallway. Hi, Annie, said Linda. How's it going? Not so great, I said. Uncle Marco just left. Oh, that's too bad, she said perfunctorily. Her voice dropped. Listen, Annie, you gotta help me out. Can you tell Jeff to meet me at Domino's at 8, to eight tonight? It's really important. Thanks a lot. I gotta run. Dutifully, I called Jeff. Because of their parents, they didn't dare call each other and arrange their dates themselves. Oh, hi, Annie, Jeff said. How's it going? Not so great. Uncle Marco just left. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. His voice dropped. Uh, you hear anything from Linda? She wants you to meet her at Domino's tonight at 8. Oh, great. Thanks a lot, Annie. See you on Monday. I walked into my room and closed the door and thought about the boxes. They were all I had of Uncle Marco. His room was as empty of personality as a hotel room. All his personal possessions, the things from his childhood, had been removed. Some he had taken away with him, others Aunt Ruth had sold. 
He never used them, she said, and they were making clutter. When she got rid of them, she could rent the room out and make money from it, since he was so rarely there. But she never rented it. Even though she could have made me do most of the work, a tenant would have been a burden for her, and she was too lazy. And she really didn't need the extra money, despite what she said. So the only mementos I had of Uncle Marco were the boxes. I could hear the TV downstairs. Aunt Ruth was occupied. I opened the closet and squatted down and removed the old shoes and outgrown clothes I'd piled on top of the gray metal box. I went over it carefully, stroking it. The surface was rough where it was stained and dented. There was no lip. It seemed to be permanently welded shut around the edges. But Uncle Marco had told me not to try to open it. That must mean there was a way to do it. At, and that was when the overwhelming desire to open it came over me. Of course, I felt guilty for even thinking of it. Uncle Marco was my favorite person in the world. How could I imagine doing something that he had so strongly told me not to do? Something that would make him angry, that might even hurt him. But Uncle Marco was a strange guy, always full of secrets. He never told me everything. He had told me absolutely nothing about the boxes, except not to open them. So what was their secret? And why had he left them with me, anyway? He must have had some other safer place where they could really be locked up. They weren't very safe here, in a closet and in a basement, especially with nosy Aunt Ruth around. What could be his real reason for leaving them here? Could it be that he wanted me to open them? No, that was ridiculous. I was just making excuses for my own curiosity. Curiosity coming from my loneliness and from missing him. He'd expressly told me not to even think of opening them. And he was serious when he said it. And as I was telling myself this, my hands were running over the surface of the box, feeling for cracks or latches or keyholes, and finding nothing. But the box in the basement was just a wooden crate. It might be easier to find some kind of opening on it. Anyway, even if I found something like that, it didn't mean I had to open it. I, I wouldn't open it, I told myself, pushing the metal box into the back of the closet and piling stuff on top of it again. I would just go down to the basement and check out the wooden one.